All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, Four Years of Progress. I hope that you and your families are safe and healthy during this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, of course, we would love to be with you in person today, um, giving this presentation, but we're, we're so grateful that you could join us online this afternoon. Um, my name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a, a nonprofit membership organization um, that uh, protects, restores, and conserves Maine's environment now and for future generations. Uh, for more than 60 years, uh, NRCM has been protecting the places and the way of life that make Maine so special. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters um, all around the state and around the country. Our office is located in Augusta, uh, just steps from the State House. Before we get started with today's program, I uh, just wanna make a few notes about the Zoom technology that we're using this afternoon. I'm sure uh, we're all Zoom pros at this point, uh, five months into this thing, but uh, just a couple quick tips. Um, so this webinar is being recorded and tomorrow afternoon, you'll receive an email uh, with a link to watch the recording on YouTube. Um, your video and your audio is disabled today by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our, uh, our panelists uh, this afternoon. If you have a question for any of our panelists based on their presentation, uh, please type that question in the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. It's a little uh, Q&A uh, chat box. Uh, that's a place for you to type in your questions, and we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, at the end of our presentation. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Melanie Sturm, who is NRCM's Forest and Wildlife Program Director, to introduce today's topic and our panelists. Melanie. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This month marks four years since the creation of the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. On August 24th, 2016, President Obama designated Katahdin Woods and Waters as America's newest, newest national monument as part of the National Park Service. KWW sprang from the generosity of the Quimby family and the hard fought work of many Maine residents, elected officials and business owners. NRCM was among those who were adamantly in support of the monument to conserve this spectacular part of Maine's North Woods. Today, KWW, spanning over 87,000 acres of mountains, rivers, and forests adjacent to Baxter State Park, is open to the public for a variety of recreational activities. Do you have questions about new infrastructure, what effects the monument has had on businesses in the community, or what's going on at the federal level that may impact the monument? You'll learn all about it today from our panelists. Here to tell you more about the monument and its four years of success, we're pleased to have uh, Andy Bossy, Executive Director of Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, Lindsay Hill Downing, owner of Mount Chase Lodge, and Kristen Brengel, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Parks Conservation Association. With that, I'll turn it over to Andy to get us started. Excellent. Well, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Todd and NRCM. Uh, I was so glad to hear you say uh, the community and the number of supporters that have come together. This image you're seeing right now is from one of our anniversary celebrations. Obviously, we are really bummed we're not getting together, but this community, the community of organizations like MPCA and NRCM, businesses like the one that Lindsay runs, and individual supporters from across the state, the nation, and even the world are what has made this incredible gift possible, building off of the incredible generosity of the St. Clair and Quimby family. So while we can't get together this year, we're happy to be here and know that the community is part of why we do this work. So another part of our community is the Wabanaki people. Uh, these are their ancestral homelands, uh, that comprise the present day Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. If we advance to the next slide, we'll see this view right here has been looked at by human beings for 13,000 years. And so as we start this conversation today, I think it's really important to mention that uh, these are the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki people, and we have a lot of work to make sure that they're part of this community and that their stories um, and their, their stewardship of this land is understood and embraced moving forward. 
So I'm going to explain a couple different things about updates with the monument four years after Katahdin Woods and Waters. And the first thing around visitation is signs. That's right. We saw the signs. Uh, Ace of Base was my favorite album growing up. Uh, and we have signs in the monument. Uh, so now people can get to the monument. Uh, it was a struggle to get there. Maybe a past administration throwing up a couple roadblocks before we could get road signs but we have them now. Um, so one thing we're really curious about is who on this call has actually visited Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. So thanks Todd for putting that up. If you could respond to this poll question, that would be fantastic. I'll keep talking. Um, so uh, other things that are happening uh, to develop the monument are resources. Um, and so on the next slide, you'll see the first map that was ever created of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. Um, that's here. Uh, and once you vote, you can see it. But there's a number of other visitation resources that exist. The map adventures map, uh, the first recreation map, we have a loop road map, uh, several other things, a bird checklist, which is getting lost in my background, and a night sky guide, and many other resources. Um, visitation this year is up. Um, about 10% for the month of June before the previous June, and that's building on yearly increases in visitation from before. So this is really interesting. All right, we have poll results. So 50% of you have not been, uh, a quarter of you have been once, and then you know, about another quarter have been uh, twice or more. Um, and so if you haven't been, what I'm gonna say is, when people come to a unit of the National Park Service, they come with certain expectations. They think Yellowstone, they think the Grand Canyon, they think Acadia National Park. And what is important to know if you're visiting for the first time is this is a park in its infancy and it doesn't have yet that level of infrastructure and support. So it's really important if you're visiting the monument to touch base with people with local knowledge. You can call the Park Service, you can call us here at Friends. You can also talk to people like Lindsay Hill Downing, uh, an owner of a business in the region. And there are visitor contact stations in Patton at the Lumberman's Museum and also in Millinocket on Penobscot Ave. So before you plan a visit, reach out and we can help align and orient you uh, with uh, a visitation that meets your needs and wants and desires. So um, let's see, moving forward, we're in COVID as has already been mentioned, um, and people are curious about what the status is of the park. The park is very big, so we can socially distance. If you can't social distance when you're in the park, and Todd, you can advance the next slide, um, then please wear a mask. Our huts are closed um, right now because of COVID. Um, and um, when you go to those visitor contact stations I just mentioned, there are precautions being taken there. Everyone wears a mask, plexiglass, there's hand sanitizer, that type of thing. Um, so uh, please visit, but visit responsibly. Um, in terms of visitation, another huge development has been the International Dark Sky Association has designated Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument a dark sky sanctuary. It's the first dark sky sanctuary, and we can go to the next slide, Todd, on the east coast of the United States of America. It's the only the second sanctuary in the Park Service and the 12th in the world. And it means that these dark skies are now protected um, and it encourages visitation from astrotourism. The next slide would show us why that's so important. This is a map of light pollution. And you can see the area that Katahdin Woods and Waters is uh, in is in this really dark patch, that darker color, not um, that gray color. And it's important to know that 80% of the people in the world can't see the Milky Way. As someone that grew up in Caribou, Maine, that's astonishing to me, but it's a real asset for us moving forward. So I also want to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Uh, there have been a number of improvements in the four years since the park was created for infrastructure. What you're seeing here is one of the newest trails to open up. This is a trail to DZ Pond, and this is a viewing platform on DZ Pond. We had some local students out there in the fall during this beautiful snow. Um, and it's often a place where you can see moose. Right now, there's a crew actively working on creating portage trails, or not creating them, but cleaning them up along the east branch of the Penobscot River. There have been new facilities that have been installed, so you uh, don't have to rush for a bathroom. And there's also better signage in the park as well. Um, 
Besides that, uh, there's also improvements that are starting to happen along the East Branch on camping. We're not ready to announce any of those yet, but they're in the works. And one area of uh, infrastructure that's really interesting is the overlook. We are planning, uh, this next slide will show you, this is the view in the most popular place in all of the park, uh, the overlook on the loop road. Um, this, we're working here at Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters with the National Park um, uh, Service to make improvements to this area that help deliver on some of those expectations that people have when they visit a unit of the National Park Service. So that's in the works and you'll be seeing that soon. Um, also, a great development in terms of the park is staffing. So at, when the monument was created, uh, the first person hired is the park superintendent. This is him right here. Uh, Todd was commenting how great his mustache is and I gotta agree as someone that can't grow one. Um, this is park superintendent Tim Hudson and he for a long time was the first and only full-time year-round staff person to the monument. I'm delighted to report that we have an additional uh, full-time staff person, Jean Roy, who's chief of interpretation, and there's plans to add additional staff um, year-round. Um, and there's also seasonal staff that come on to support during the high volume season of visitation, which we're currently in. Um, so that's a really great development to make sure people can be oriented and also stay safe when they're visiting this special and unique place. Another area that I would like to up to date on and that I started this off with community is the communities of the region. And we have, um, there's been a concerted effort to make sure the next generation of stewards are engaged in this uh, National Monuments um, future. And so we have several programs called that engage uh, youth. This is teachers from teacher camp that are part of the Katahdin Learning Project, a place-based learning initiative that's getting literally thousands of kids at this point have had opportunities, students, excuse me, not kids, uh, in the monument. In addition to that, we also have had uh, youth trail crews that have been working in addition to AMC. This is the Baxter Youth Conservation Corps. We partnered with Friends of Baxter to provide an opportunity in the monument last summer. It's not happening this summer because of COVID, but we do have a group of Wabanaki students that are in the monument right now learning about their ancestral lands and making improvements on several of the trails um, throughout the park. So that's all really great. Uh, I, what I would just wrap my comments up with here is that great parks um, require friends groups and require communities like this, and they require partners like NRCM. And whether you're drawn to this work because it's protecting the flora and fauna uh, for the future, maybe you're a recreator, maybe you are interested in lifting up the aspirations of people in a region that were devastated by the collapse of an industry. Um, all of those are valid reasons to be part of this. And the future is brighter when we come together as a community to advance this special and unique place. And it's truly a pleasure to be working with all of you, um, many of you NRCM members, members of friends, and people that love this place. So thank you so much. Thanks, Andy. Awesome pictures. Now we'll hear from Lindsay Hill Downing, the owner of Mount Chase Lodge. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, first, I'd like to kind of start off by just explaining where we're located. Um, Mount Chase Lodge is a traditional sporting camp located just outside the north end of Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument and Baxter State Park. Um, we're about 10 miles west of Patton. So where is that in the state of Maine? Well, about two hours north of Bangor. Um, and two left turns, what I always tell people, it's pretty easy to get here. Um, so I'd like to kind of start off by um, giving you a, a brief history of the lodge here. Um, we were established in 19, well Mount Chase Lodge was established in 1960. It was built by a local guy by the name of Henry Schmidt. Um, and Henry, Henry and his wife Mary ran the place primarily as a hunting and fishing lodge um, from 1960 to 1976. And in 1976, my parents came along um, and they purchased the business. Yeah, there's a wonderful photo of them hanging with the Mount Chase Lodge sign 
Um, and they came into this business and, and took it over as a hunting, hunting lodge. Um, when, when they came to the season and they didn't really know a whole lot about it, but they learned very quickly. Um, so that this picture kind of sums it up really well. I'm not quite sure how old they are here or at what point in their career this was, but it was probably before I was born. Um, my husband, Mike, and I bought this business in 2016, right before the monument was designated. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit here, but um, kind of looking back at, at the evolution of activities that people did in this area, you know, like I said, my parents bought it, it was a hunting lodge. We certainly had people coming up to vacation and see the area, but their primary business and clients were hunters. Uh, and that's a picture of me standing next to a guy there. I don't even remember his name. My dad would know. Um, but I remember very vividly that, you know, the end of the summer meant hunting season and we were hunting until the end of November. And, and uh, so that, that, was, that was the business probably up until the, gosh, I don't even know that it was, it was strong into hunting all the way through the 90s. The next photo here is gonna show a picture of um, the Boy Scouts. And my folks were able to develop a, a close relationship with the Matagammon High Adventure Base and that filled the gaps for them uh, that hunting and fishing did not. Um, fishing kind of dwindled out in the hot parts of the summer and these Boy Scouts would come in and kind of fill that gap from June to end of August when they would start back up with their bear hunting. So the Boy Scouts have been coming here uh, for, you know, probably about 40 years and they were heading up to Matagam and High Adventure Base. Um, my parents catered to them. They would come in and spend one night here before they went on their canoe trip up the Allagash. Uh, and it worked kind of as a landing base for them. And that, that filled in their summers really quite well. Next photo is gonna show an old picture of snowmobiling. And that just goes to show, these are old snowmobiles. Those are classic antiques right there. But snowmobiling has been around for a while. Um, but when was that taken? Probably early 80s. Um, snowmobiling was not an industry that, that brought a whole lot of money to the area prior to the, the 90s. Um, and it really kind of started taking off in the 90s um, up until today. And I'll show, we'll show some photos later of, of now, but now this region without snowmobiling in the winter um, would, would be hurting for, for sure. Now the first wave of skiing, this next photo shows some skiers in the, back in the 80s. And uh, mom and dad really tried to cater to them as well, but it, it really, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for skiers in the area. Um, they had a little ski trail around, but the ma to maintain it became cumbersome. Um, so a lot of the skiers that would come here were going to ski through Baxter State Park, and that was really what was attracting the skiing, the skiing clientele. Um, so now we've actually got a poll question here. We'd like to know what kind of activities that you've done or that you would enjoy if you came to the monument. So if you can take a minute and fill that out, that would be awesome. Um, in the meantime, you know, my husband and I knew that the creation of the National Monument would diversify the type of people coming to the area and, and that would in turn help the economy significantly. If we could open doors uh, to people who wanted to come up and hike and mountain bike and paddle on top of what we already did here, which was fishing and hunting and snowmobiling, um, you know, we were, we were only going to be helping ourselves in having lots to offer all of the different kinds of recreational enthusiasts. So, so now we're gonna jump back a little bit and uh, the next photo here is gonna be a wonderful photo of me going to school. That is Lindsay at five years old <laughs> on my first day of school, uh, anticipating whatever it is you anticipate when you're five, I don't know, <laughs> sand and blocks and letters, I guess. Um, but, I grew up here, you know, um, this, was, this was normal life for me growing up in a hunting lodge. Um, I, I grew up doing all of the activities that, that we catered to. I went hunting with my dad, although I wasn't particularly fond of shooting guns after I got knocked over. Uh, I went snowmobiling and I really loved snowmobiling in a, in a large way, but I wasn't, that wasn't something, that wasn't a passion that I could really 
follow through anywhere else. Like I had to be in Chimpond, Maine to be able to go snowmobiling. So w after high school, I kind of took off looking for a little bit something more. I, I went to college off in New Hampshire at Plymouth State University. And, and what was really attractive about that school to me was, were the outdoor opportunities. There was so much hiking in the White Mountains. There was skiing. Um, and I ended up getting a degree in adventure education and that allowed me to find jobs in some pretty exotic places. After college, I traveled to Southeast Alaska where I was a sea kayaking guide. Uh, I then went out to California and I worked some outdoor education jobs at, out there and, and traveled all over the state of California. Uh, started to get a little bit homesick and I got a job back here at Maine Hudson Trails. And that's where I met my husband, Mike, and we decided to go hike the AT. This is over a period of seven or eight years, by the way. This is um, After we hiked the AT, we went up and we actually got jobs up in Alaska at a, at a high-end backcountry lodge in Kenai Fjords National Park. Um, and up there, Mike really got trained to cook under some really wonderful professional chefs. Um, and then we came back and we started working for the Appalachian Mountain Club over in Greenville. Um, so we spent two years over in Green Greenville at Gorman Chairback Hut, and maybe some of us, some of you saw that. This is a photo of me out in uh, Red Rocks Canyon, just sort of pursuing, pursuing the activities I couldn't do here. I think we, right there we were looking, getting ready to climb up some, some rocks. Certainly never an experience that I ever got uh, back here in Maine. Um, so yeah, so at this point we've, we've kind of caught a little bit We've caught up to the, the talk of the National Park and the National Monument. It was gaining steam. Uh, my husband and I were really starting to try to find our place in the world. And my parents, you know, 40 years of, of operating this place had, had sort of taken their, it's a toll on them. Um, and so they were ready to, to be done with it and pass it on. We saw a huge potential for growth with the National Park becoming a reality at National Park, National Monument. Um, this here's a photo of snowmobilers. So this is just showing, you know, there is, the National Monument does allow snowmobiling in sections. Um, and it's a huge part of our local economy in the winter time. Um, so we had this, we had this idea uh, to continue the sporting camp tradition. Um, we, these are, this is a group of hunters just talking. This is only a couple years ago. The tradition up here is when you get a deer, they all sit around and they listen to the story. So this is Dan telling a story about how he harvested his deer. Um, so, you know, we still continue to cater to, to all the people that made Mount Chase Lodge possible in the beginning. Um, we still love to have them up. And now we've just kind of expanded on, on everything that we offer. Um, we take, we've taken everything that we've learned at all these other high-end lodges. We've brought it back here, um, you know, and we really work hard. That's a picture of my son, Walter, hanging next to it, swinging next to a deer. It's kind of a joke, but it was uh, just to show that, you know, history is very important. Uh, it plays a big part in, in how this economy works up here. Um, and the monument has allowed hunting and allows snowmobiling in a certain section. Um, so we're really, really fortunate that the history of this place has been valued by, by the monument. And so, you know, we, we are bringing our food skills back. My husband's an incredible chef. He takes a lot of pride in the food that he cooks here for our guests. Um, we serve kind of, we serve high end gourmet meals here, family style. So it's not anything that you would get anywhere else in the world, really. Uh, family style, family style dining is not, is not something that you get every day. Um, but we learned how to do that at these other places and we brought it back here. Um, this next slide shows a picture of Mike in the kitchen. He spends a lot of his time in the kitchen, even if he doesn't need to be in the kitchen, he enjoys, he enjoys what he, what he's doing. Uh, and you just can't you can't replace that. That's, that's invaluable to a business if, if people enjoy what they're doing. And we certainly do. Um, this last photo is, uh, is just a family photo. And, you know, we couldn't be happier here as a family. This is exactly how we wanted to bring up our kids. Uh, the National Monument was the path that brought us home. And, and um, it's just, it's really been such a wild ride and so incredible to see it grow. Um, so 
last thing I'll just talk about is how things are going this summer. Clearly, it's a little bit different of a traveling climate than we've seen in the past four years. So we have uh, we've made a few changes and tried to go with what people are looking for and, and what we can handle as our growing family uh, needs our attention a little bit more than they have in the past. Uh, we're offering we're offering meals. Um, it's not necessarily in the same community dining um, atmosphere as we've been doing for the past four years, but this is a temporary change while we kind of get through COVID-19. And um, the people are coming up here, they're having their socially distanced vacations and, and they're really loving the, the fact that there aren't lots of people up here. So I've lost track of time, I apologize. Uh, but that, thank you for, for joining me here. Thanks, Lindsay. I love to hear your family's story and the history of the Lodge. Our last speaker who we'll wrap up with before we open the floor to questions is Kristen Wrangle. Kristen, take it away. Thanks, Melanie. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to NRCM who invited me to be on the call. And I just want to say uh, we worked together uh, for many years uh, leading up to the designation of the National Monument. Uh, with Lucas St. Clair and the Quimby family and um, NRCM really um, is known for working with the community and making sure that um, community input was really Im critical to the designation of the monument and the support um, for the monument before it was designated and I, I just want to say um, you know it's just been great uh, working with them for so many years and and really for a national group like ours to engage with um, a statewide group like NRCM, it's just been wonderful. So uh, a little shout out to you guys. Um, and to Mount Chase Lodge, where my daughter and I have hung out with the dog and the piano and the great food. And so um, she had the time of her life there last summer and still talks about it with all of her friends. Um, so it's uh, been a wonderful, um, experience for my family uh, spending time at the monument too. So it's, it's becoming an annual tradition except for this year during COVID. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm a member of the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. Um, yay. Uh, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about what the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument sort of means to the larger national park system. And um, for those that aren't familiar with NPCA, we are a national organization. We're 101 years old. Um, we have been advocating for national parks since the National Park Service began. Um, we were actually started by the first Park Service director, uh, Stephen Mather, and we have just grown over the years and now we have offices all around the country. We try to put them near national parks. We don't have one yet in Maine. Um, our nearest office is in New York. Um, but we work on park specific issues and we work on national issues that help parks uh, thrive. And so um, I run our government affairs shop here in Washington, DC, um, and I helped uh, out with the designation of Katahdin. And so I love this place and it has just grown on me so much. And part of why um, it was so critically important to look at open space and, and uh, natural areas like Northern Maine um, is because the East Coast doesn't have a lot of big national parks. Um, and we certainly don't have a lot of wild spaces uh, within the national park system in the Northeast. Um, for those of you who are watching right now who are familiar with the national park uh, units on in the New England area, maybe you've been to Cape Cod or Acadia, Maybe you've been to Lowell in, in Massachusetts or New Bedford Whaling, but um, these park units are um, a little bit smaller um, and don't have sort of these large um, forested areas. In fact, when you look at a park service map, a park system map, um, the nearest sort of big NP national park is probably Shenandoah in, in, in Virginia. And so, um, you know, wanting to protect more ecosystems, wanting to protect more wild areas is a huge, hugely important part of what we do. And 
um, some of the folks who probably travel near um, in the New England area are familiar with the Adirondacks and areas of New Hampshire around um, the Appalachian Trail. Certainly I've been to a lot of those areas too, but the National Park Service brings not only the heft of its name to an area, but you know, really it's designating places that are nationally significant and that um, should be protected. And so it was wonderful when the Quimby and St. Clair families wanted to donate the land that they acquired. Uh, they actually have more land around the Appalachian Trail, but really looked at this uh, cluster of land near Baxter State Park and, um, and some of the significant pieces of, of Katahdin Woods and Waters that made it so nationally significant is its wildness. It's the east branch of the Penobscot River. Um, it's the Saboas, it's the Wasada Cook Creek. It's um, these places that are wild rivers. Um, and I think we haven't yet, but wild and scenic designation is a total possibility uh, for this park unit. And um, most people on the East Coast don't get to experience such wild areas that are just bursting with wildlife. I was looking just before this call at um, some of the wildlife management in the Adirondacks and they um, are continuing to work on uh, bringing more animals to the area and reintroducing. Katahdin already has them. And so uh, for so many East Easterners, um, what Katahdin represents is this sort of um, that romantic wild place that you want to go to really experience nature on its terms. Um, and just having the fabulous sights of um, Mount Katahdin in the distance, um, it's just thrilling to be up there and you really feel like you're, you can get away when you're up there and I'm sure that's why most people go there. But that, those all played a role in, in the dark night skies. Um, these all played a role and these were all factors when President Obama decided to go ahead and make Katahdin Woods and Waters a national monument and sign that proclamation. And you can actually go online. I think NRCM's website also has it, the proclamation, and you could see why um, the monument was designated. But it's just so wonderful to have 80,000 acres of protected national park land that's contiguous with a fabulous state park. So you get to really see um, Maine and its northern Maine in its full glory um, and, it's, and it's protected and it's yours. It's everyone's and we can all go and enjoy it. Um, and so, uh, so we're excited that, that Katahdin is part of the park system. We're sad we're not celebrating all together the fourth anniversary up there. Um, but I hope people will join NRCM, join the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, go stay at Lindsay's place, um, really embrace this area and help us get this monument um, to uh, sort of like what Andy was saying, some of the standards of what we expect in a national park unit. So right now the loop road is still sort of a dirt road. We wanna make sure that we fix the infrastructure there. We wanna make sure we have available um, toilets and lean-tos and other things that people can um, have that you expect kiosks, informational kiosks, um, and hopefully down the line, some visitor contact stations so that people can experience um, park rangers and get some help when they go to the park. So we're working on it. We are absolutely working on it and we are um, trying to get Katahdin the resources that it needs in order to um, have some of those um, typical attributes that you see in a national park unit. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing back here in DC to help um, Katahdin and the other national parks. Um, so some of you may have heard um, that President Trump signed into law the Great American Outdoors Act recently. This was a huge effort um, that we undertook with many organizations from around the country and Andy and others were back in DC um, lobbying for the bill with us, um, other friends groups from around the country as well. And this bill is, does two amazing things that can benefit Katahdin in the future. First of all, one side of the bill is about deferred maintenance. This is maintenance that is not getting done right now because there simply isn't enough funding for the Park Service to do these projects. What's deferred maintenance? Roads, trails, um, structures, historical sites. Um, so what the Great Out American Outdoors Bill will do is it'll provide the entire park system 
$6.5 billion, with a B, dollars to start fixing up these deferred maintenance projects. Now, like I said earlier, one of the issues that we have in Katahdin is we want to improve some of the roads, like the Loop Road. Um, we also have some campsites like Lungsus um, that have this enormous, wonderful history and are also, it's just a fantastic spot to, um, to go paddling um, and enjoy um, uh, a bunch of activities there. I think my daughter got lost in the tall grass near Lungsus once. Um, but it's a fantastic area and we need to repair some of these uh, structures within the park or within the monument. And so um, Katahdin should be eligible for some of this money. And so we're hoping that, um, that it does. And the, the, the money will be put into an account in the treasury department and it will be there in accruing interest over the years. But Congress has in a mandatory way said that they will put $6.5 billion from energy revenue into this account and it will help fund infrastructure and deferred maintenance projects um, throughout the park system. So we're hoping some of that money will find its way to Northern Maine. We also hope some of it will go to Acadia for those of you who like to go to Acadia too. Um, I know Kevin could use the money um, for um, some of his work. And um, uh, and then the other side of the Great Outdoors Bill is the Land and Water Conservation Fund money. This is, some of you are very familiar with it who've worked on other national parks. Um, this money goes toward land acquisition. And that means that if there are access points or um, additional lands that can be acquired from willing sellers around Katahdin, that this $900 million per year will go into land acquisition. Now this 900 million goes to national parks, national forests, refuges, all sorts of places. It also has a state side funding element to it. Um, but what we're also hoping is that, like Lindsay was saying, um, snowmobiling, trails, skiing, people need um, sometimes a way to access these trails from private property and mm -hmm. Um, this money will allow the acquisition of these kinds of access points in order to um, uh, use some of the recreational areas. And so we're excited that the Great American Outdoors bill passed and, and was signed into law. Uh, I have to admit it was kind of a dream bill um, for the park system. Uh, for some of you who've traveled around the country and seen different national parks, we have some old aging national parks. Um, the Yellowstone Loop Road was built for stagecoaches, you know, way back in the day. The water pipeline to the south rim of the Grand Canyon, it's bursting. So there were a lot of really immediate needs for the Park Service, but um, uh, hopefully this money will be spread out throughout the system and we're, um, we're going to be working really hard to make sure some of it comes to Maine. Um, so the last piece is operations money. And, um, and this gets to what Andy was talking about earlier with Tim Hudson uh, being the only staff person. Uh, it's critically important that Katahdin get more staff, absolutely critically important. Um, we want it to be a flourishing national park unit. And so it's great that they've added an additional full-time staff person, but not only do we need full-time staff people um, because one of the areas of, one of the reasons why Katahdin was protected as a national monument is because it has so many cultural artifacts, uh, whether it's Wabanaki, Penobscot, and it is just um, not, there hasn't been enough research done in the area on both the cultural resources and the geology of the area. And so we want more people out there figuring out what folks were doing on the ground, uh, what the history is of the area, the fossils. Um, and in order to be able to do that, we need to get staff there. Um, so we need not only um, the staffing, but we need employee housing and things like that, just like every other park unit has. So the Park Service Operations funding kind of goes like this with the economy. Um, and with different downturns in the economy over the years, we've seen um, increases, some small increases in park operations um, but what we need is to 
really advocate for more funding for park operations so we can get more folks there. And it would be great. Uh, Andy showed some pictures of the wonderful volunteers, um, you know, whether it's like working on roads or bridges or culverts or the overlook. Um, it's really, really important that we get some more staff on the ground to really help with the future of what this park unit is going to be. So I hope folks, like I said before, get on our action alert list, get on the friends action alert list, become a member of NRCM, um, get invested in the advocacy part of, of this work because we want to make this one of the greatest national park units. It kind of already is, but, um, but you know, we want to get it to where it needs to be so visitors can, can have that typical park experience. And so, um, so please join us in the advocacy of it. Um, but I'll stop there and we can take some questions. Thanks, Kristen, and appreciate you underscoring the importance of advocacy and what happens in DC. I would love for Maine to be self-contained and not need to you know, rely on federal funds, but they are a big help. So thanks for explaining those three important parts of the Great American Outdoors Act. We do have a lot of questions and I must admit many people have specific questions about certain activities they can do in the monument, which areas they can access. So I thought, Andy, we might start by just telling folks what the Friends of KWW website has available, what types of information is um, there for browsing. So maybe folks can go online later and find out answers to their questions and much more. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, yeah, so uh, the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Water website, I did, I think I typed an answer to that so you can see NRCMs and um, our website and as well as the National Park Service. So right there you can find those links. Um, we have information about how, different types of trips you can do, whether you want to paddle or bike or uh, hike. There's trip reports on there. There's a list of different places that have accommodations um, that you can also visit on there. Uh, and then some of those resources I just put up on the screen, like the Loop Road interpretive map, as well as our dark sky guide, um, are right there on there. Uh, in addition to that, I should mention that if you become a member of Friends, the map adventure map gets mailed to you automatically, but you could also purchase it um, on our website or at many of the local businesses in the region. I think, Lindsay, you, you saw it too, right? Yep. Um, yeah, we have it here. Yeah. Great. So, so there's all kinds of resources there. And I, I did see someone asked about if there's a fee and there is no fee to be in Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. It is open and available to you. It will say if you want to camp overnight, it's important that you visit the National Park Service website and contact them about an overnight parking permit if it's not at um, one of the designated campgrounds. Great, thank you. Yes, I definitely encourage everyone, well, check out NRCM's website, but also friendsofkww.org was um, the website Andy was talking about. Uh, Lindsay, there was a question um, or more of a comment and request for you to expand on why you and Mike chose to offer um, catering and such fine dining experience. Why did you choose to go that route? and build off of the success of your parents' business? We had experience at other lodges that, um, that offered that sort of dining experience. Um, and that was something that my parents always did. They always fed their guests that were here, um, you know, but cooking was not my mom's passion. That was, that was kind of her job. And Mike, is, it's certainly his passion. So. Um, he's, he's very good at it and it is what we, it's what we know. It's what we essentially grew up doing, um, at all these other little jobs that we, that we worked and, um, you know, we learned how to cater to people's dietary needs and, and we learned how to cook for vegans and we knew that we were going to be seeing a lot more, uh, a lot more of those sort of people that came up here with specific, you know, dietary requests and things. So, um. So yeah, that's, you know, we, we took the business model that, that already existed and then just sort of built on it. And we also kind of knew that we needed to figure out a way to make a little bit more money. And so we opened up to reservation dining and, um, and that helped us in a really, really big way to, to engage in the community and, and carry on what we knew how to do so well. And, and this area was also lacking, um, lacking 
dining options. So uh, yeah, that's kind of a little bit more about that. That's great, thanks. I can attest your food is fantastic. I encourage everyone to go. <laughs> um, Kristen, question for you. I was hoping you could explain a little bit more about the process of this monument being designated. You were there working hand in hand with NRCM and many, many others to make it happen. And um, I'm sure many folks on this call helped in that advocacy, but it is a really big deal. It's a huge accomplishment for the uh, monument to have been created and designated four years ago. So do you have any additional insights to explain to, about like the uh, DC insider point of view of how that all happened? So many stories, so little time. <laughs> um, well, when you want to designate a national monument, um, you actually, what we did was we uh, worked with um, the delegation, the main delegation, um, and uh, basically the, the entire delegation at the time said to Lucas St. Clair and, and those of us who were involved, NRCM and others, and, and so many main-based groups, and said, listen, you, you have to get community support. You have to show that um, folks really want this to happen. And so, you know, many of you have heard Lucas, um, his stories about sitting in people's living rooms and drinking a lot of coffee and really getting to know what people wanted in the area. And some of the things that people talked about wanting were the hunting opportunities and snowmobiling and then hiking and um, biking and paddling opportunities. and that was all taken into consideration um, when we thought about what this uh, monument was going to look like in the future. And I think um, many people sort of experienced the various maps that were put together of the, the property that uh, Roxanne Quimby owned. And, um, but we sat with people and, and really tried to um, uh, understand, you know, what, where everyone was. I traveled up to um, uh, East Millinocket during the whole process and uh, Lucas and I did a talk with um, the Bangor uh, Daily News uh, and really sort of debated, you know, why should we have uh, this place protected? And so we just spent time with whoever would sit down with us and talk about the, you know, what it meant to be a park service unit and what it could possibly bring to the area. Um, and then some of you may remember that um, Senator King invited John Jarvis at the time, he was the Park Service Director, to come to Northern Maine and um, to the university and do a sort of listening session. And I, I actually flew up for it too. And um, just an enormous amount of people in the auditorium at the university in Orno. And um, I think Lindsay, you spoke um, at the uh, gathering. Um, and, uh, and it really was a listening session um, where Senator King and Director Jarvis stood there and took questions from folks from all over Maine and responded to people's inquiries about what it meant for the Park Service to be up there and, and what could possibly happen. And people had specific questions about the management of the area. Um, and, uh, you know, it went very well. And so we were talking with Senator King and um, the other members of the Maine delegation about the possibility of doing legislation. Um, and at the end of the day, um, uh, the Quimby St. Clair family really wanted to make Katahdin happen. Um, and, um, and decided to work with the delegation on going to the White House and asking if Obama would make it a monument. So, um, so basically, at that point, um, the Interior Department started to look into whether or not it was actually feasible to bring Katahdin into the park system, because that's part of, um, you know, how you look into how to establish a park. It has to be you have to be able to manage it and it has to be nationally significant. And so, um, so basically President Obama and Secretary Sally Jewell at the time gave it the green light. And um, with the community support and with the support of, of Senator King and others, um, we were able to get the White House to, to declare it a national monument. And so what happened was um, 
Roxanne Quimby and the Quimby Family Foundation then donated and, and at Elliottsville Plantation donated the property uh, to the federal government. And, um, and the federal government now owns it and, and has the title to it. So um, it's, a, it's a long, arduous process. I did not go into the intricacies of it, but um, you know, property ownership is, has its own you know, issues and, and parks have to go through appraisals and everything like that. But, um, but it was a very inclusive process and it was very, um, you know, um, it was, we tried to do as much community engagement as possible and answer people's questions. And so, um, but you know, in all of these things, you never know if it's actually gonna turn out the way that, you know, you want it to be. Um, so it was a complete labor of love, but um, we're glad that we're here right now. And we're glad that there is this protected place that's under the park uh, service management. So it's got a very, very good possibility for a great future. And, um, and there's no better agency to manage, manage this area than the National Park Service. Thanks, Kristen. All right, Andy, I have a question for you, and then I'm gonna squeeze in one more before one o'clock for Lindsay. So, Andy, could you speak to the upgrades going on at the monument and um, specifically things like road improvements or the status of the visitor center? Sure, so um, the roads in the monument, as was mentioned earlier by Kristen, are dirt roads, um, and they're, they're likely to stay that way. Um, early on, uh, there was definitely some maintenance that needed to happen to those, and what I'm delighted to report is that they are being graded more regularly. So if you wanted to travel the loop road, what I like to say is they, the loop road is now uh, safe for both Priuses and pickups alike. So I own a Prius, and I would take it around the loop road no problem. Um, uh, there are some other roads that maybe you want to be a little more cautious about there as well. Um, and in terms of visitation, like I said, there's those two um, visitor contact stations in Millinocket and in Patton, the Lumberman's Museum in Patton, and then at the uh, uh, Penobscot Ave in Millinocket. And there's a lot of helpful resources there too. And we are, you know, thinking about how we can serve visitors uh, even better in the park uh, moving forward and at other places. Um, so there's some plans in the works around that, but nothing ready to come out of the hopper yet, so to speak. Thank you. We have so many great questions. I want to apologize to people who aren't getting their answers or their questions answered. Feel free to reach out to NRCM um, as for follow up if you want to get more information. So Lindsay, you're going to be our last question, which is um, about garnering support for the monument when it was being uh, debated. Edie asks, um, many people in Northern Maine were first against the monument. Lindsay, when did you feel the tide began to turn and people saw the value of the monument and began to support it? Great question. Um, this all started a long time ago. I, I don't know exactly the year that Roxanne purchased the land. Um, but I certainly remember in high school, um, the tensions that were building when she did purchase the land. Uh, there was a major snowmobile route that came up alongside the East Branch um, and that got, that got cut off. Um, but it was, you know, she was very manageable to work with, but a lot of people were angry about losing their camps and such. And I remember just growing up and, and it was a very, very touchy subject, even in my own house. Uh, my parents were on different sides of the spectrum at first. I remember one night sitting at the dinner table and my dad was grumbling about losing bear hunting sites in the snowmobile trail. And my mom is on the other side saying, but what if it became a national monument or a national park? Like that would bring people. So it was always an argument. And uh, in 2014, when our interest kind of sparked and, and it really started to gain steam. Um, that's when we noticed like a significant amount of other business owners and, and people in the area were starting to really gain support and go to the meetings and write letters to the Bangor Daily. And there was a lot of, um, and RCM helped out a lot in making sure that people who were supportive of the idea were heard. Um, and it, for us, was a little bit edgy to come out, um, you know, on such a political, you know, contentious, people were really, really angry about it. And we, you know, when we started writing letters of support, 
about that, we got a lot of hate mail um, and people never showed up and told us how they felt, but we got a lot of emails saying that people were going to sabotage our business and, and all of this. And it, it was really pretty, um, for somebody who like had just bought the business, it was really kind of intimidating. Um, of course, I never responded to that negativity because I knew that the, I knew that it was already bringing a positive change to the area. So by the time the monument was designated in 2016, it was still kind of a hot topic for a few lo locals. But at this point, um, people have accepted it. Um, there's still a little bit of grumbling around town, I'm sure, but I, I don't hear it anymore. And, and I think for the most part, we are, we are on the road to being positive about the area and the way that we're moving forward, so. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing the local sentiment. And um, actually, before we go, Andy, there's just so, so much interest in people visiting the monument and about um, different sports and whatnot. So could you just end this with telling folks how much it costs to get in, what the park hours are, and again, um, where they can get answers to questions about um, specific um, recreational op opportunities? Absolutely. So it is free to enter Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. You can do so at any time of the day year round, except for in the winter, the roads um, uh, close. There are gates for the roads, but you could walk it if you wanted to. Um, it's a long walk. Um, so th th there's that. Um, resources, again, um, the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters uh, website, that's friendsofkww.org. There's a lot of resources there, including where you can sign up to be a member. Members get an entire package upon their first time of maps, uh, many of them mentioned here today. I'm also delighted to say that right now all memberships are being matched in the month of August because of the the celebration. Um, and then there's information I put in the chat box or the Q&A box, the website for the National Park um, Service that has the contact station hours in Millinocket and in Patton. You can find those there. Um, and then of course, NRCM in that same chat box has information um, about visiting there. Uh, and then many of the local businesses. Again, having a conversation with someone that knows the area, whether that's at Friends, at NPS, at NRCM, or one of the local business owners, is really the way you want to like kind of orient yourself. It's uh, it's not a secret, but but there's folks that really know how to guide you, and uh, you should take full advantage of that. Thanks, Andy. Todd, do you want to wrap us up? Sure. Uh, well, thanks um, to all of our panelists. Thank you, Lindsay, Andy, and Kristen for joining us today and for um, all of your great work past, present, and future uh, to make sure that the KWW National Monument uh, is, is successful long into the future. Um, obviously, thanks to Melanie for being my, my co-host here today. Um, and thanks to all of you who joined us online. Again, we would have loved to have been with you in person, but appreciate you adapting and uh, joining us in this brave new world of, of Zoom uh, meetings and webinars.